Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Between the Vines. I'm Jennifer Phillips Russo, the Viticulture Extension Specialist for the Lake Erie Regional Grape Program. This program is a collaboration between Cornell and Penn State University Specialist, and my guest co-host for this year has been Dr. Terry Bates. He's back again today. Thank you, Terry, for joining us. Good morning, Thanks. Jennifer. <laughs> Good morning. We're going to talk about more of our nutrition stuff, the work that he's done over the past 25 years, and also touch a little bit about where the Concord is right now in the growing season. So with that, I'll just hand it off. Well, do you want to start with pH or do we want a tough talk? No, let's talk about the bit. <laughs> we should talk about ripening because that's what I, what's on everyone's mind. And and I'll apologize to those who are not in the Lake Erie region listening to this because it may not pertain to you as much. But in Western New York, we are struggling to ripen the fruit this year. Um, and I mean, there's... Well, I want to say we're struggling to find a reason why, but you know, when you kind of look at the grapevine phenology and the weather that we've been having, it's it's kind of, we can explain it. It's just disappointing that the fruit's just not accumulating sugar as quickly as we would like it to. Um, let me share my screen. However, I am hoping that the forecast for the next 10 days is going to help us out a little bit here. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, so we track bear, fresh berry weight and bricks accumulation in Concord year after year after year. We've been doing this for, I don't know, as long as I've been here. Uh, and so the poor ripening that we're seeing this year is equivalent to what we saw in 2003, which is, you know, one of those years that we always, a lot of us remember as being a crummy ripening season. Um, we did, you know, so that, in 2003, in particular, we had a pretty large crop um, and and like poor weather conditions late in the summer in in through Verasian. So we had slow ripening. Um, the, the two things about that year that stand out to me is is that the mid season crop estimation and thinning worked really well. So those who thinned had higher rates of sugar accumulation. Those who did not thin really struggled to get their fruit in. Um, but the other big difference was that the berry weight was smaller. So it was, we had below average berry weight. And that helps with accumulation of sugar concentration in the berries. And even in 2003, the we had some dry weather late in the season and the berry weight started to shrivel and so it could concentrate the sugar even more and that helped us get that crop in the door this particular season <laughs> we we have large berries and um uh, you know we have this model where we look at the growing degree days two weeks prior to bloom and at that time we predicted that we were going to have larger than average berries so i mean the, the berry weight thing everyone wants to say oh we had such a wet july and a wet august and that's just it. you know it's increasing the berry weight you know so our our average berry weight here at the lab in our phenology block is about three grams and we said at bloom based on the growing degree days prior to bloom that we were going to have like 3.1 3.15 gram berries and they're like 3.2 right now so we we predicted we were going to have larger than average berry weight and now the wet late summer um is increasing that even more you put on top of that a poor ripening like weather conditions so you know it's like the worst of both worlds <laughs> so larger berries and slow ripening and we're so we're not getting that berry dehydration yet to help concentrate the sugar and get it in the door and that's why i mean i think some of our best stuff is this week has been about 14 and a half bricks was some of our best stuff. And what I mean by that is there's a question about we had an extended bloom period and does that extended bloom period, is that adding to our bricks problem now? And the answer is yes, of course, an extended bloom period is going to have berries of different ages or different phenology stages. And that's going to add variation like within a cluster, between clusters within a vine, between vines, and between vineyards. I mean, it just adds, uh, a com you know, the next level of variation within the vineyard. But when I say our best stuff here at the lab, 
we have blocks that bloomed early, bloomed uniformly, and have a low crop load, and they're still only at 14 and a half bricks. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and, yeah. So some of these people are looking for answers. Right. Was it the extended bloom? Was it the uh, the wildfires in Canada? And it's like all of it's no, 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 no. We just, we have big berries. We have a wet, cool, late season, and that's just leading to low uh sugar accumulation in the fruit and as of last week when i wrote my crop update we were 301 growing degree days behind last year so just the whole season has been a bit yeah long. the sum it, yeah i think there was um another similar year was like 2014 and i went back and looked at a crop update i wrote for 2014 and i think the title was something like the summer that never happened so mm -hmm. we just we just get these seasons where that happens. Um, I guess the last thing I would say, we talk about fruit maturity in terms of just bricks. And I do think when we get into years like this, there's a uh, there's another factor we need to be looking at. Like if we just wait forever for the bricks to get to where we want them, you know, or whatever the standard is, 15 and a half, 16 bricks. If we wait that long, I think there are other like when we ran the juice quality trial a long time ago, they tried to have identifiers for what the juice tasted like. So in that particular tri trial was we have all these different pruning levels and we picked each pruning level when that treatment reached 16 bricks. Yeah. So some of the higher cropped stuff like the minimal prune vines, you had to wait forever for it to hit 16 bricks. And when you did, like there were descriptors on the way that fruit tastes. So if you have all of this fruit that was all picked at 16 bricks, but it was picked at different times because of different crop loads, the late stuff had what they called an old grapes flavor. So they put it in front of a taste test panel. They trained them on like 30 different descriptors. And like, oh, there were three descriptors. Two were positive, one was negative. So there was like grape flavor, sweetness, and an old grapes flavor or something like that. And old grapes flavor was the, the negative attribute. And the it was that it, it was that late that yeah long hang time fruit and Concord that gave you the old grapes flavor. So I, I just think there's this this kind of dynamic balance. And when you get a year like this, if you wait for the sugar to get to where it is, you may be picking up that that old grapes. And it's just you're getting more damaged berries, you're getting more oxidation, um, mm -hmm. just you're getting older grape flavors right. <laughs> in the fruit. So. I don't like I don't know what the solution is like I don't know how you predict when you get a gear like this like maybe we should just be picking them at a lower sugar level to like cut your losses right. say the flavors there we just got to do more concentrating with the fruit to get to sugar level where we want it Ooh. and and the last thing I'll say <laughs> <laughs> we could just end this podcast and not even get onto the nutrition stuff. Uh, there was a question about like in 2003, we saw a big crop load effect where if you thin the grapes that you saw an effect and it's like, you know, is there a crop load effect this year? We're getting mixed like messages coming in from the industry. Um, and we have, so on our farm, we have, we've done our crop estimate. You know, we used our spatial data. So the whole my EV thing, uh, we used spatial data to predict crop size. We use spatial data to predict pruning weight. And from that, we calculated our yield to pruning weight ratio or our revase index. So we have a predicted revase index for the farm. For your crop load. So yeah, we know, like we have a predicted map saying these vines are undercropped, these vines are balanced, and these vines are overcropped. And we're sampling against those. And this one chart that I'm showing at the bottom is showing that yes, there is a crop load effect in the season where the stuff that is balanced or undercropped is ripening faster than the stuff that's overcropped. So, you know, that makes sense to me. Um, the interesting thing there is, so we're, we're watching that weekly and typically what we see both overcropped and undercropped vines, they start at Verasion at about seven and a half bricks. And that first week, we don't, we never see any difference. They all start ripening together and everyone says, ah, oh, I shouldn't have thinned, you know, or I don't care about crop load anymore. 
but it's in that weeks two, three, and four after Vrasian where you start to see the separation in bricks accumulation. And this year, week number one, we saw no separation. We we expected that. In week two, we started to see the separation again, that the lower cr low crop load stuff had higher sugar accumulation rates. And then in week three, we're like, all right, we're cooking with butter now. We're going to get even higher accumulation rates in the balanced vines and we didn't it was low sugar accumulation uh, low sugar accumulation across the board and we lost that week number three and that's i think what's really hurting us and now week four we see the separation again where the balanced to undercrop vines are outperforming the overcrop vines but now the rate of sugar accumulation is starting to taper. So it's having less of an impact. Lower, yeah. yeah. So for whatever reason, we lost week three. And I don't, maybe that's the one that's puzzling me because it was warm that week. It was sunny. We had high humidity. So that might, you know, impact it. And the berry weight did jump that week. So there could be a dilution effect going on, but. I think at the end, was, you're just like, oh, it's kind of like we're going to blame the whole thing on week three. And it's so funny because it it shows you how important those the weather conditions are in that post bloom or post Verasian period, like right. how one week can make such a big difference. If only we could predict it. <laughs> like, oh, well, if we had a crystal ball, we'd all. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't be in viticulture. I'd be a weatherman on TV making a lot more money <laughs> if I could predict the weather that well. <laughs> Oh, well, that was a feel good story <laughs> for this year. So I think we should maybe talk a little bit, change our two pH and okay. listen just so that we can get, get that bad taste out of everybody's mouth. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is also a really good time of the season. So we're a couple weeks past for Asian to be out in your vineyard, you know, <laughs> If your harvest schedule is delayed and you have nothing better to do, <laughs> you have some time uh, right is now. to this is a good time of year to go out and scout your vineyard for potential nutrient deficiencies. So stuff like potassium deficiency or magnesium deficiency will be showing up, especially in Concord vineyards. I'm seeing them um, both. Yeah, so I even have examples. I went out to our nutrition block that we have for the high res vineyard nutrition project where we have low nitrogen, low potassium, low magnesium sub blocks in that. And I know a lot of people are listening on the <laughs> and not seeing, but I don't know. Can you see that? A little, so there, yeah, you know what? Because you're sharing your screen, it's super small. Oh, you know. Okay. Hold on. Let me stop it's, sharing it's, my screen. It's a tiny Terry. With a yeah. Bear. Okay. Oh, there it is. Black. That is what potassium deficiency looks like. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot <laughs> of trying to get the right angle. Uh, so yeah, we call it black leaf. I know in Washington state, they have a thing called black leaf, which has to do with oxidation within the leaves. I think having to do with like heat stress or water stress and, but in our very wet part of the world, <laughs> <laughs> um, you start to see this bronzing on the leaf kind of all over and usually on older leaves first so potassium is a mobile element in the plant and so if it's not getting enough potassium from the ground it takes it from these older leaves and it shunts it towards the yeah the the growing shoot tip and then in another part of the block you see this yeah. we're inducing some magnesium deficiency we have a lot of that going around yeah so there's a lot of that going on so and we can talk about this about wet years you tend to get a lot of potassium and that can outcompete the magnesium. But so you get that kind of tiger striping going on in the leaf and that's uh, classic. It is a classic. It's a little yellowy instead of for those of you who can't see it. Yeah. Low tiger striping. So inter intervenal yellowing chlorosis. I call them tiger stripes. Um, and yeah. So a lot of times you'll see like a green margin around the leaf and then you get that striping in the middle. That's a, classic kind of magnesium deficiency and not to be confused with like nitrogen now this one might be tough to see so okay. our nitrogen deficient vines are just yellow all over you just get a pale yellow not really an intervenal chlorosis it's just the whole leaf is kind of small and yellow it just kind of doesn't look right 
So that's our nitrogen deficient. And we have that going on. So if anybody wants to see that. <laughs> we should do an article on that. Like we should take photos for another time, but we can talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> so all right. this is all done because you actually manipulated the pH of the soil. Yes, we did. And I'll show you how, because so based on everything we're going to talk about here, <laughs> about what we know about. Um, so we've done several trials looking at soil pH, both in pots and out in the field, and how we manipulate the soil environment to give us those different deficiencies. Let me share my screen again. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I always start here <laughs> okay big big picture we always talk about um if you fix these these major problems when you're talking about nutrient management in the vineyard right a lot of people just think how much fertilizer do i put down like what kind of fertilizer you know what kind of nitrogen do i put down and how much it's like okay let's talk about a vineyard nutrient management plan and to me if you correct water issues you increase your active organic matter and you adjust your soil ph especially in the lake erie region where we our soils are naturally low in soil ph if you adjust your soil ph with lime if you correct those problems you've a lot of times you don't have any nutrient deficiency problems at all um and to me those are amendments I can get my computer to work. <laughs> okay, okay, amendments versus fertilizers. So again, to me, an amendment is something you do to change the soil environment. So, you know, maybe you install tile drainage or irrigation, um, depending on what your water needs are. Increasing active organic matter. So that's the whole thing about soil health, cover cropping, keeping, you know, the soil covered for as long as you can during the season, increasing biodiversity all that good stuff about soil health um, and then soil pH is, is the chemistry it, and the reason I say this is that that's a 24 7 nutrient management plan right what are you doing this weekend some people are getting their picker ready some people are tuning up their bow to go bow hunting <laughs> you know some people are going hiking in the woods what are the microorganisms in the soil doing they are cycling nutrients for their own benefit but then that can also be for the plant benefit as well so our major job as farmers is to create the soil environment for which good nutrient cycling happens and then that'll lead to better vine growth so that is it's like something you should spend 80 percent of your time thinking about and doing and stop thinking about, oh, one time a year, I'm going to go out and put down some salt potash fertilizer and it's going to correct all my problems. I mean, you're just, you're not seeing the big picture. And for those of you <laughs> who are listening at home, you cannot see the big smile across my face. From yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and now I will taper that by saying, I'm not saying fertilizers are not important because there are definitely times that that is part of your nutrient management plan. There are times when your vineyard really needs it and the only way you can get it is through additional fertilizer applications. And so I'm totally down with that. I'm just saying, don't totally ignore your vineyard and then think I'm gonna put down a little nitrogen and it's gonna solve all the problems. That's not, that's not the way mother Thank nature you. works. <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's get past all the water stuff and everything I just talked about. I want to get to the soil pH work that we talked about. Nitrogen, we talked a ton about nitrogen. <laughs> okay, she saw me zipping through my my slides. Um, okay, we're even going to get past this because we'll be talking forever. Okay, yeah. when it comes to potassium magnesium and calcium and soil ph right it's all has to do with cation exchange capacity of your soil right it's the amount of positive charge that is on that soil per mass of soil <laughs> so this is where everybody's brain explodes they go what okay it, you know almost all of our farmers out there they know how to charge a battery in their car right you have the positive and the negative <laughs> um you know anode and cathode i mean most farmers understand that when you're talking about working on their tractor battery so in the soil you have clay particles and there's a net negative charge surface charge on those clay particles 
and we can talk nerdy about isomorphous replacement in the you know <laughs> layers of the soil we don't, we don't want nerdy. clay we don't have to worry about that <laughs> what you need to know is that that action in the soil creates a net negative charge on the surface of the soil particles and that will attract positively charged cations onto the soil and the the how much your soil does that is called the cation exchange capacity so a soil with higher clay content and it depends on the type of clay that you have uh, you know based on this graph <laughs> you can have higher CEC based on the, what kind of so, what kind of clay particles you have. So Lake Erie soils tend to have a lot of kaolinite um, in it. So you know it's very common in our soils to see a cation exchange capacity between five and fifteen. Now you can go to some Midwest soils um, or just other soils in the United States, and you can get much higher cation exchange capacity. So much higher ability to hold nutrients in the soil than you can. So the smaller the particles, the more surface area they have. So the more ability they have to hold on to some of those. That has um, a lot more to do with water than than nutrients. So it's you are right that you have so all can <laughs> most of your cation exchange capacity comes from clay particles, which are inherently small compared to sand um, particles in the soil, but it also has a lot to do with how well it hangs on to water. Um, and it's, it's kind of the type of clay because it has to do with the clay lattice and the chemistry of what's in between the, the lattice and the clay and like just nerdy stuff. We don't, we don't right? need to, yeah, cream. we don't need to get into all that stuff. Um, so it's not all bad. You say, oh, well, our soils have low CEC. Well, that's not all bad. You don't want you don't want soils when you're talking about grape production. You don't want so much nutrient holding capacity that your vines are growing to the moon. You know, we want to control our vegetative growth a little bit, um, and this helps that our cation exchange capacity isn't through the roof. Okay, so there are good guys and there are bad guys when it comes to the nutrients that the vines need right so the vines want calcium they want magnesium they want potassium they don't want aluminum aluminum can be toxic to root growth um so again we talk about nutrient supply uptake and demand and this is we're talking about supply now so you have your soil particles they have a net negative charge. They attract positively charged cations. And your cations are aluminum, calcium, magnesium, potassium, um, ammonium, and sodium. And ammonium and sodium are kind of small players in our high rainfall areas. If you go to more arid climates, sodium can be a problem. So you get salty, sodic soils. Mm -hmm. um, so let's just talk about the first four. <laughs> We talk about the strength of cation absorption. This all this all makes sense in the end. And it's how strongly a cation will be attracted to the net negative charge on a soil particle. And aluminum is out competes everything else because it's got a plus three charge and it just holds on to the soil. So if there's a lot of aluminum, soluble aluminum in the soil water. It's going to be attracted to the soil particles and it it's not going to leave room for calcium and magnesium and potassium. This is the main reason why we change soil pH. Because at a lower so soil pH that aluminum lets go. Yes, so there's a, a lot of aluminum in our soils naturally, but it is most of it is in an insoluble form like think of aluminum foil <laughs> like it's there but it's not exchangeable on the soil particles it's not exchangeable with the root system it's just tied up right and but as you drop the soil ph so if you get a soil ph um below five i usually say 5.2 right you're gonna solubilize that aluminum your aluminum foil is going to start to dissolve <laughs> and it's going to be available to the roots when that happens. right and so now you have all this free aluminum floating around in the soil moisture profile and that um that it 
that is attracted to the soil particles. And our rule of thumb is about 200 ppm of soil aluminum is where you're going to start having a problem. And that typically happens at a pH of about five. Um, so whatever below and that and it's like an exponential thing that as you drop that soil pH, you get that much more aluminum. So if you're down to a pH of like four, you've got all this aluminum and then you have no room for potassium and calcium and magnesium and you start. I mean, if you look at our low soil pH blocks, the vines are runty. They're just, <laughs> they're small. Yeah. Aluminum will also um, interact with the growing root tip on a grapevine. So it'll actually reduce root growth. So now you have less roots. You don't have any nutrients in the soil. And so the vines are just sick and they're small and you want to raise the soil pH. And so we do. And you know, I always say you want to get the soil pH above 5.2 and a 5.5 to 6.5 window is acceptable for Concord production. I also 5.5 to 6.5 with all my nutrient recommends. Yeah, it's just whatever. It's a good window and people are like, well, you know, is 5.7 better than 5.8? And I'm like, there's no way. <laughs> Like you can target it that specifically. There's so much variation within the soil with, you know, just especially with our soils because they're old, you know, they're ancient beach ridges and every 20 feet, it seems like the soil type is changing a little bit. And, and then natural processes just decrease that soil pH over time. Yes. Yes. The buffering capacity of our soils tends to be like, five or a little bit below five so like if you apply lime to get to six and you just stop applying lime it'll it'll drift back down right. you're you know as my dad used to say you're shoveling sand against the tide <laughs> right oh, you're productive. gonna do it you're gonna sh you know you're gonna you're gonna apply some lime and you're gonna raise your soil ph and you're gonna improve your soil chemistry and then over time that's gonna slide back down especially if you're using nitrogen fertilizers so ammonium nitrate and urea are actually acidifying chemical reactions in the soil so if you apply lime and then you, you know, you apply lime once and you get your soil pH up to six, but then for 10 years you apply nitrogen fertilizer, you're just going to slide that soil pH back down more quickly. Right. Um, so it's just something you have to keep watching and adjusting for. Um, okay, so as you raise the soil pH, so like, okay, let's just make the assumption everyone's listening and has been listening for a quarter century, me telling you, <laughs> get your soil pH above 5.2, 5, 5.5 to 6.5 is good. And apply two tons of lime per year, per acre in established vineyards until you hit that target. And if you just do that, then <laughs> you've then you have, have you're winning the battle at that point. <laughs> Uh, okay, so now let's talk about the competition. So if we raise the soil pH and we get rid of aluminum, aluminum now becomes insoluble and it's just not a, uh, it's not a big factor in soil chemistry anymore. And you raise your soil pH. Now what happens to calcium, magnesium, and potassium? So calcium outcompetes, magnesium outcompetes out potassium on the soil cation exchange sites. So that strength of absorption favors calcium over potassium. Mm -hmm. Then there's the issue of plant uptake. So that that's supply and then uptake. So plants will use proteins in their root membranes to shuttle different nutrients across the membrane. And <laughs> I'm giggling at the scientific words that we're using. People are just going to. Yeah, so I mean, there's, <laughs> you know, the roots take up nutrients, they just don't absorb nutrients like a sponge, they actually have to cross a membrane. And so the membrane has essentially doors, and the doors open, and I have a potassium door, I let potassium in, I have a magnesium door, I let magnesium in. Um, so those transport proteins going across the membrane is something that is highly regulated by the plant. I think that's like the big thing, right? It's just not a passive sponge. Right. The vine actively is saying, I want to keep these ions out and I want to bring these ions in. So it turns out that magnesium and potassium 
look to the plant can look very similar in their charge and their what we call the hydrated radius. So the doors that let these things in can get confused. <laughs> and I can't, I think the latest research on this is that there are doors specific for potassium and the doors that are specific for magnesium will also let potassium in. So if you flood the system with potassium, you can inhibit magnesium uptake. Um, not necessarily, it's not necessarily true in, in reverse, like the potassium doors kind of only let potassium in. When you think about it in context to what your graph is showing here and your <clears throat> figure is showing here, magnesium is larger than potassium. So yeah, so so as you raise soil pH, the 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 solubility and the 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 amount of calcium that's on the cation exchange sites goes way up. Magnesium goes way up, but potassium stays flat. So now we get these differences in balance between, and, and there's really a competition now between magnesium and potassium in terms of uptake. So there's nutrient supply, and as you change the soil chemistry and change the fertilizer you put on the ground, and then there's uptake. So you have competition between magnesium and potassium. This is why when we do our recommends and we say if your pH is higher, your mag is going to basically outcompete your potassium. So we want you to supplement with potassium at that time. Yes. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> I learned from the best. Um, so this chart shows showing the same thing as the last one. So as you raise soil pH, you increase calcium, you increase magnesium and potassium stays flat. And there's a lot of like, you know, corn growers in the Midwest, they talk about the soil ratios. So again, we're talking about nutrient supply in the soil. They talk about these ratios of 20 to four to one. And so a lot of people will do all their like nutrient management and trying to hit these ratios. And the work that we've done shows if you have young Concord grapevines or you have low producing Concord grapevines, you know, you're probably not going to go wrong with that 20 to four to one ratio in the soil. But we have found out that as you increase the yield in Concord, so you're, you know, you're a commercial Concord grower, you're trying to hit that eight to 10 tons per acre yield year after year after year, we know that that 20 to four to one is not good enough because the fruit has a high potassium demand. The, the statement I always make is that about half of all of the potassium that's in the vine at Verasion is in the fruit. So the larger the crop, the larger the potassium demand. And if you go strictly with this 20 to four to one ratio, you're not get it, you're not going to get enough potassium. You have to like bump up your potassium levels when your crop level gets higher. Um, so it's more like instead of four to one between magnesium and potassium, it should be more like two to one or even one to one to get enough potassium in those high producing cropping systems. That's what I was going to ask if it was more like twenty four to four, which would be twenty one to one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, so how do we do this? We we apply lime to the soil, as we already said, five five to six five is preferred. Um, there's a you know the term buffer pH is essentially the way they do this is you take two soil samples and you apply the same amount of lime to the to that soil, and you see how high the pH gets raised. And those with a like a higher buffering capacity, you have to add more lime to get it to change, and and again, what that the point is, if our soils are buffered at a lower pH, say at five or a little below five, if you raise the soil pH with lime, it is going to drift back down. There's like you're shoveling sand against the tide, right? It's just you just have to stay on top of it. Um, two to three tons per acre per year of lime, uh, and that's based on 100% calcium carbonate equivalent. People talk about cal calcitic versus dolomitic lime. I don't care. Use the cheapest form of lime that you can, <laughs> um, because it's the carbonate that's doing the is really changing the soil pH, not whether you have a calcium or magnesium carrier with it. Um, and that lime has low mobility, so it is a challenge in our 
established vineyards that you you almost have to neutralize the upper soil layer before that lime starts to move through the soil so in a pre-plant situation you don't have to stick to the two to three tons per acre per lime per year you can if the soil test calls for six tons of lime to change the soil ph up to like a ph of six you can put half of that down, deep plow it in as much as you can, put the other half down, disc it in, and then plant on top of that. And that works out really well for us um, in establishing a vineyard. But once you have an established vineyard, again, you don't want to go more than two to three tons per acre per year of lime because you don't want to just, you don't want to slug the soil with that and have this calcium magnesium imbalance with potassium so if you dish it out a little over time you can change the soil ph and not run into these big fluctuations and potassium deficiency in the vineyard so, oh, that's sort of what you just showed Look at yeah <laughs> <laughs> so well, let's put the whole thing together so i look the you know <laughs> they can probably just put this i don't know in my eulogy <laughs> <Not bad. laughs> uh, years from now <laughs> yeah so this kind of puts it all together nutrient supply uptake and demand um and it has to do with changing the soil ph cation exchange capacity what the balance of those cations are on the cation exchange capacity and then what your vines need in terms of you know pushing towards our higher cropping systems so again, as you raise the soil pH, you actually change the cation exchange capacity of the soil that has to do with the chemistry of aluminum. So we say like our soils should have a cation exchange capacity like 10 to 13, but if you have an acid soil, your cation exchange capacity could be as low as say four, like that's not good because you've you've actually <laughs> lowered the ability of the soil to hang on to positively charged cations and as you raise the soil ph you increase the cation exchange capacity and you change the distribution of those ions so as we said you get as you raise the soil ph you get a lot more calcium you get a lot more magnesium and the potassium kind of doesn't change all that much right. um and then in our high producing concord systems, we need a lot of potassium. So that's we're in the five, five to six pH range. And then if you're growing big crops, you wanna you wanna have a maintenance dose of potassium. 150 to 200, right? Pounds of potash, which is like 50 pounds of potassium. And uh, <laughs> As a management practice, um, which we need even now that I'm thinking about our nutrient analysis on our farm, this farm, <laughs> we even need to do a better job of it. Is you want to the you almost want to front load the vine with potassium because dry weather conditions can limit a potassium mobility in the soil and uptake in the root system. So you kind of want to have enough potassium in the vine before we hit real dry summer conditions and that usually starts in june so are you suggesting those two weeks before bloom when we've had the moisture in the soil from the winter yep mm -hmm. yes yes <laughs> um i think i might have a all right here we go <laughs> petiole values you just led right in that and i forgot i even had this slide in here um so the the high res vineyard nutrition project is looking at like leaf blades and petioles at bloom and verasion to kind of see what tissues and when we should be taking those tissues to have them analyzed. Um, but based on like the historical stuff with petioles in Concord, uh, we have standard values. So the, the red line is pH of um, by five and is that right? That looks like I have it backwards. Anyways, <laughs> you want, um, yeah, that, okay, yeah, no, I got it right. <laughs> it's like, well, it's not like you have Sorry, it's like <laughs> getting later in the week and I'm having a brain freeze. So 
That's right. As you raise the soil pH, you have more magnesium, you're going to have less potassium. So the blue line at higher soil pH has less potassium in the tissue. Um, and we talk about at Bloom that you want to have more than 2% of potassium in the petioles. Mm -hmm. So you'd want, I mean, that's like the minimum, <laughs> like you want more. Um, so you want to be above 2% at Bloom uh, because so potassium starts high in the spring and then it goes low in to verasion. But that separation stays between vines that have potassium and the ones that don't have potassium. That makes sense because you had said, you know, the vine needs potassium to grow and half of it goes into the fruit. Yes. So if you're having more in the petioles, which is the vegetative or leaf stem, then it goes more into the fruit at verasion. Yeah. It should decrease. So it's information like this that we use to base our like standard values on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you want to compare your tissue values in your vineyard with the standard values that are published, you need to take your tissue sample at bloom or at verasion. <laughs> but say you're like, okay, I'm in my vineyard. It's the middle of the season. I'm like, I'm seeing poor growth in one section of my vineyard and I have pretty good growth in another section of my vineyard. You can take tissue samples anytime and just keep those separate. Keep the, you know, the poor vine tissue samples separate from the good vine tissue samples. Send them both in for analysis and do your own comparison. Right. Forget about standard values. Just say, oh, I see that these weak vines over here are low in potassium or low in magnesium or low in nitrogen um, compared to the ones that are growing more strongly. And then you can narrow it down to what nutrient problem you have and adjust accordingly. Variable rate. Or do it variable rate. <laughs> With the future of sensing technology that we can <laughs> well, no, boom, there we try go. <laughs> to get rid of tissue sampling altogether uh, because it's labor intensive and it's costly to take tissue samples if we had a sensor that would give you the say nitrogen distribution within your vineyard you could fertilize against that uh, and that's what the high res vineyard nutrition project is all about and you can go to high res high, high res vineyard nutrition dot com or something i don't know <laughs> <laughs> one of those I mean. If Patty Skinkus is listening to this, she's going to say, why didn't you give them the right website? <laughs> Search she for does a great job with that, by the way, <laughs> podcast as well. Yes. Hmm. Patty Skinkus is Oregon State University, and she runs the High res Vineyard Nutrition website. So there's a lot of good information out there about that project mm -hmm. if you want to hear more about it. We will certainly have a write-up in a future crop update as well. Yeah. Okay, so this podcast, once again, has gone way over time. <laughs> we do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least we can save some to talk about. The point of the story is get your pH where it needs to be, and you'll have the proper nutrients for a good plant growth. It's 5 5 to 6 5. Yes. Make the That's a start. Yeah. Make the <laughs> amendments based off of tissue samples after. Yes. Tissue and soil. I always recommend both hand in hand so you see mm -hmm. what's available in the soil and what's being taken up by the plant. Yep supply uptake demand you gotta you gotta use the three of them together to have a good nutrient management decision thank you so much for being here i don't want to take any more of your time we need to save stuff to talk about for the next time <laughs> and because we are getting into harvest in the thick of things you have that one week to get out there and look for nutrient deficiencies in your vineyard that we will probably take a little bit of a break. It probably be about two, maybe yeah. three weeks before our next one. But happy harvest, everyone! We hope everything. You can use the right. the My EV data collector app on your phone to go out and rate nutrient deficiencies and map it in your vineyard. How about that? There you go. And there's, there's my shameless plug for today. <laughs> well, there's a tutorial for that on the Vit blog at myefficientvineyard.com. No, I'm yes, sorry, there. efficientvineyard.com. Yep. Okay, everybody, awesome. have a great week. Best of luck with your harvest. Be well.